I'm Jennifer Cook. I direct the Africa program here at CSIS. Um, and welcome to today's event, which is Nigeria's elections 2015, what have we learned? Um, I want to give a very warm welcome to our guest of honor today, uh, Chairman Atahiru Jega. Uh, yes. <laughs> Chair of Nigeria's Independent National Electoral Commission. Uh, Professor, welcome back to CSIS. It's really great to have you here and under very happy circumstances, too. Thank you so, very thanks. much. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, well, thank you for all the commendable efforts to get us here so soon after the elections. Thank you so much. I, I do also want to recognize uh, the delegation that has come uh, with you uh, and honor the role that um, the, the commissioners played in the process. Uh, Mrs. Thelma Iramirin, uh, welcome if you could stand up, <laughs> National Commissioner. Ambassador Mohammed Ahmad Wali. <laughs> Ambassador Lawrence uh, Nwuruku. Uh, we also have Coyote Udowu, Prof <laughs> Professor uh, Oki Ibanu, who uh, has been very helpful to us. Welcome back. Uh, and Anthony Adebayo Adenji, who's a, a senior program uh, assistant. Thank you. So welcome, and, and thank you also for the role that you play within INEC. Um, for those of you who haven't been following uh, the Nigerian elections, um, they went very well. Uh, <laughs> uh, they were not perfect, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but thanks to the efforts of so many people, um, Nigerians, uh, the region, in the international community to some extent, uh, helped ensure a credible, peaceful process. Uh, and these elections, which really had the potential uh, to, to tip into something um, perhaps violent and certainly uh, precipitate a political crisis of some, uh, of some sort, went extraordinarily well. Uh, in the circumstances. I think they exceeded the expectations of many. Uh, they were improvement on the 2011 elections, which already were a significant step up from the processes in 2003 and 2007. Um, first of all, these were extremely important uh, elections for Nigeria. Uh, they came at a moment of huge political fl flux. I think there was uh, an unraveling of the consensus around succession rules. There was a shift in political alliances as a coalition came together to challenge um, the People's Democratic Party and the incumbent, uh, Good Luck Jonathan. Um, there was a lot of residual tension um, and uh, I think fear from the 2011 elections aftermath, um, which left uh, 800 people dead in its wake. Um, and, of course, there were the predations of Boko Haram in the Northeast and the possibility of an unraveling um, of an amnesty in, in the South-South in the oil-producing Niger Delta. There was no clear-cut winner going into these elections. Uh, the Nigerian rumor and conspiracy mill was in uh, full force. Uh, and I think uh, there was a lot of tension and acrimony in the lead up to these between the parties among regions and even many Nigerians told us along religious lines, which was particularly alarming. Uh, the elections were postponed from um, February 14th, Valentine's Day, to uh, March 28th, uh, and that fueled a whole other set of um, accusations and conspiracies and so forth, and I think we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, these elections were incredibly important for Nigeria. They were also very important for West African region and for the United States, which sees Nigeria as really a critical partner in West Africa on so many fronts, on, in insecurity, in economic, in its role in the sub-region, and, uh, and globally as well. And I think it was that, the importance and what was at stake in these elections that prompted CSIS to launch the CSIS uh, Nigeria Election Forum uh, at the beginning of 2014, and, and Professor Jaga was among our first guests. He came with a great delegation of, of civil society leaders. Um, and uh, the, the forum was sponsored by the Ford Foundation Nigeria. It allowed us to bring civil society members, media, security analysts, political party leaders, 
here to CSIS to, to talk amongst each other in a neutral venue, but also to kind of convey to a Washington audience uh, and the, the U.S. policymakers what was at stake in these elections, what, was, what were the priorities, and where best might the U.S. use its uh, assistance and diplomatic uh, voice um, to, to assist. Uh, there were many critical players in, in the election um, and some you know, real standouts in terms of some of the youth movements and uh, uh, election not be war. We're going to have the representative from that campaign coming in a few weeks um, to the Council of the Wise, to the Peace Council, civil society that used technologies and social media in, in messaging, in monitoring the elections. Um, political leaders um, who um, played a mixed role, I would say. But in the end, I think uh, President Jonathan, who graciously, graciously conceded, uh, and uh, President Buhari, now President Buhari, who gave a really, I think, um, very strong uh, inaugural speech that was quite inspiring, I think, to, to bring Nigerians together again after this very raucous um, election cycle. But at the center, uh, and with many responsibilities and many expectations on their shoulders, were, was the INEC, and the International, uh, Independent National Electoral Commission. And Professor Jaga, as the leader of that, really, I think, deserves standout recognition among the many players uh, it, it, that, that contributed to the success of these elections. Innovations set in place in 2011, I think uh, the, your demeanor throughout the process, uh, taking criticism calmly, uh, taking notes, really unflappable, unperturbed by the political uh, conspiracy mill that was kind of flying around you, um, and ultimately delivered um, what were not perfect elections, but were, were uh, credible, uh, uh, credible elections. And, we talk a lot about institutions uh, over individuals, but I think individuals also can make a difference within um, institutions. And I think Professor Jaga did a lot to, to boost the credibility of the elections of the Electoral Commission, uh, and that says a great deal. Um, we, I won't go too into depth on your, on your biography. Um, uh, uh, Professor Jaga was studied at Amadou Bello University. Uh, he was actually one of John Payden's students, I believe. And, and John Payden is not with us today, but he's, he's somewhere watching us on the web. So we'll say hello to John Payden. <laughs> uh, and eventually went back. Uh, uh, he received a PhD from Northwestern University uh, and returned to the political science department in Bayero University as a, as a lecturer, eventually appointed uh, vice chancellor. I only go into his background because there's going to be a lot of speculation on what you do next. Um, I received this tweet, Jen G. Cook, can you please persuade Atahira Jaga to stay on as elections chief when he comes to CSIS later this week? So um, listen, we're going to turn to you, um, I think, open up with maybe your reflections on what went well in these elections, what, what didn't go so well. What kind of what were the challenges that you faced, and and how you look back at this process now that it's uh, by and large behind you? Um, thank you very much once again, uh, Jennifer, for creating this wonderful opportunity. Um, as I look around the room, I see many friends, many acquaintances, some cheerleaders, <laughs> uh, and and I'm so happy to be here uh, along with my colleagues. Um, um, from the commission. Well, uh, what went right? Um, I think we would need a lot of reflections uh, to tease out the most important aspects of what went um, right. Uh, but I believe that in general, um, we can say that we have done our best under very difficult circumstances to satisfy the yearnings of Nigerians for peaceful, uh, credible, uh, free and fair elections. And uh, of course, uh, the 2015 general elections uh, represent something of an enigma, uh, because on the one hand, there are enormous hopes and the expectations 
uh, expressed by some uh, our stakeholders uh, and even anxieties and concerns. Some foretold uh, a hopeful turning point for our country. Uh, others foresaw an uh, apocalyptic end. And uh, I think we are all glad that by all accounts, the elections now represent a turning point and uh, uh, proved the uh, doomsday predictors uh, are wrong. And uh, of course in INEC, I must say that we were well aware that the 2015 elections would represent a litmus test for the commission. And uh, we did our best therefore knowing that we had to uh, ensure that uh, we pass uh, that test because it is a very important uh, thing uh, for our country in the sense of deepening democracy and beginning to get our politics and hopefully the governance processes uh, right. And um, so we applied all our uh, energies in the past five years to reforming the process and uh, to, to trying to be very, very adequately uh, uh, prepared. Um, I think uh, uh, our preparations went well. Uh, I believe that the first thing that we did was a learning process in terms of understanding and documenting the persistent challenges which have bedeviled the electoral process in our country. Uh, and arising from those uh, uh, reflections and the studies, uh, then we started a process of planning. And uh, we've, we did both strategic planning in the long term in terms of where we want the commission to be. Uh, we produced a strategic plan document covering the period 2012 to 2016. Uh, and then we also focused attention on more specific uh, uh, election project planning. And um, uh, of course, uh, if you have beautiful plans and you don't have partners that can help you execute it, uh, it will be a serious challenge. And we've been very, very lucky to have uh, uh, been able to develop partnerships both with, uh, at the local level with civil society organizations, uh, uh, even developed partnerships with other governmental uh, agencies, uh, such as the security agencies, uh, under what we called an interagency consultative committee on election security. Um, we forged partnerships with many non-governmental organizations, uh, civil society organizations. Uh, but uh, uh, very importantly, we also are able to develop very good uh, partnerships with uh, Nigeria's development partners. And uh, uh, I'm very glad to see in this room uh, representatives of some of those organizations uh, from IFES to NDI and uh, IRI and uh, many other partners. Uh, uh, um, there was also the Joint Donor Basket Fund uh, managed by the UNDP. Uh, so, so these partnerships are very, very important for us in terms of uh, getting ideas and expertise in the development of our plans, as well as in being able to generate funding and messaging and other support uh, to be able to execute uh, are these uh, plans. So uh, I will say that learning uh, 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 from which we develop plans, a lot of uh, the components of these plans also contain innovative measures that are targeted at addressing those persistent challenges to our electoral processes. Uh, so we identified what needed to be done, for example, to deal with the persistent challenges associated with electoral fraud. And that was how we came about developing, I mean, the idea of producing what we call a permanent voter's card that is biometric. And uh, also how we came about introducing what we call the card reader, uh, which was to help us ensure that only 
uh, those who have genuinely been registered and whose names are on the register and uh, uh, who have personally come to the polling unit with their cards uh, were accredited uh, to vote. Um, there were many other things we did. For example, we introduced policies on how to engender the electoral process. Uh, like many uh, countries uh, in our continent, Nigeria faces challenges about uh, women empowerment and participation in the political process. So we developed a gender policy and that helped us uh, to begin to uh, encourage and motivate and create avenues for increased uh, women participation uh, uh, in politics. Um, so uh, basically we've done uh, quite a lot. There are challenges, I, I must admit, uh, challenges of dealing with the attitude of our politicians. Uh, many in this room, I'm sure, are aware of the phrase, the do or die mentality of our politicians. And we have to remain focused and we have to remain uh, steadfast. Uh, and uh, by ensuring that we are not distracted by deliberate uh, efforts sometimes to either create division within the commission or to divert attention from uh, substantive issues. Um, so um, some of the challenges, of course, are associated with our own uh, uh, socioeconomic context. You know, the poor uh, uh, infrastructure and facilities which affect logistics of preparations and deployment. Uh, challenges of the procurement process. Uh, for example, one of the major challenges we faced was the dissatisfaction by Nigerians with the speed with which card, permanent voters' cards were produced and uh, distributed. Uh, and, and of course, a lot of these are associated with some of these uh, 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 systemic challenges. The procurement process was very, very slow. Uh, certain things the commission has to go to the Federal Executive Council for approval and the process is very long. Then eventually the, uh, we wanted the materials to be produced locally and the uh, contractor, the service provider had serious challenges, uh, all sorts of challenges. Uh, I think the most formidable one was electricity uh, and targets were missed. And at the last minute, we had to say, look, you have a technical partner in China. Rather than try to produce all of these things here, get a high percentage produced by your technical partner in China. So that minimized some of the challenges, but it opened other uh, political <laughs> issues and accusations and complaints about uh, up to the last minute, when we knew that all the cards to be produced in China had been produced and brought to Nigeria, we were still being accused uh, and insulted in the newspapers for having millions of cards still in China, right, which we knew were not uh, true. But as I said, we had to remain uh, focused. So, so frankly, um, uh, I think the fundamental elements uh, of what I think we did right were well, first of all studying, study and analysis and understanding the key issues. And then secondly, arising from that learning process, uh, designing innovative measures to address those identified challenges. And then thirdly, building partnerships, which uh, uh, helped us in terms of uh, executing uh, all the plans that we had uh, put in place to, to address these uh, issues. And then thirdly, and most importantly, as I mentioned earlier on, trying to be steadfast and focused, uh, trying to avoid distractions. And one of the main ways in which we did this was to ensure that uh, not only are we nonpartisan as a commission, but that we do everything possible to make people perceive us to be nonpartisan. And we also did explore all means possible to provide information and to relate with the key stakeholders in the electoral process, uh, that is the political parties.
For example, we institutionalized regular meetings uh, with political parties, chairmen and secretaries of political parties, uh, where we would come and share information on a quarterly basis leading to the election. And I think six months to the election, we started meeting more regularly, almost monthly. Uh, we provide information, they raise concerns, we address them, and through that process, we were able to bridge communication gaps, perhaps even build some trust and confidence uh, in, in the process and uh, in the commission, uh, and also uh, minimized uh, 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 challenges arising from lack of information. Uh, it didn't stop people from being partisan. They would know the issues, they will have the information, but they will still take a partisan position and uh, attack the commission on, on those grounds. But by being nonpartisan, impartial, and uh, doing our best to create a level playing field for all contestants and all parties, uh, we just maintained our focus. And uh, I think that also helped a lot. But we also have been very lucky um, to soon after 2011 elections initiate what we call a process of structuring and reorganization of the commission. And again, we got a lot of support from uh, partners uh, uh, with expertise, with uh, uh, funding, with facilities uh, to be able to do this. We commissioned a management, top management consultant to give us ideas about how to reorganize the commission. We also had independent uh, 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 assessors. Uh, we constituted an independent commission, uh, committee soon after 2011 that gave us a report about what we did right and what we did wrong in 2011 and uh, made recommendations about what we needed to do, one of which was that reorganization and restructuring. Reorganization and restructuring helped us to uh, sanitize the structure of the commission to reduce the number of departments, to minimize duplications of roles and responsibilities, and to be able to uh, redefine more carefully uh, the schedules of duties of, of departments, units, and the key officers in those commissions. And uh, uh, I believe that leading to 2015 general election, that reorganization and restructuring helped us uh, tremendously. Uh, uh, it also had tremendous impact in the implementation of the strategic plan. Uh, uh, our vision for the strategic plan was not only to do a better election in 2015 than we did in 2011, but more specifically to reposition the commission to become one of the best election management bodies uh, in Africa and indeed uh, in the world. And, and I think we've come a long way from 2011. Uh, if I reflect over what remains to be done, I think uh, with regards to restructuring and reorganization and repositioning of the commission, uh, we need to do a lot of change management, uh, uh, workshops and training and, and so on. Um, I think that's one area where there's a lot of scope uh, for improvement. Um, to have a, a competent, independent electoral commission, we need to have professional professionally trained, skilled, competent staff. And uh, I think there is a gap there that needs to be filled uh, uh, um, as we move towards uh, the future. Um, we also need to do a lot, uh, again, in terms of improving the legal framework for the conduct of the elections. Um, after 2011, the commission uh, reviewed the legal framework, the both constitutional provisions and uh, uh, the Electoral Act provisions, and uh, recognized the need for remarkable improvements and uh, made recommendations to the National Assembly. Uh, regrettably, uh, uh, one of the challenges we faced was the anticipation and the anxiety about how soon will these uh, new amendments come into effect. And up to the last minute, we remain hopeful. In spite of our repeated reminders about uh, protocols that Nigeria has signed, the uh, ECOWAS and the AU protocols, uh, which specifically suggested that any amendment to the legal provision for elections should be done at least six months to an election. 
we, we were not successful, uh, and uh, we had to do the election with the same legal framework that we did in 2011. So it was okay, but it would have been better. I give you two examples of uh, what we would have wanted to see an improvement on. One, and we're very, very lucky, uh, uh, the, uh, the provision regarding runoff election uh, was almost impossible uh, to comply with, and it's a constitutional provision. The commission is required to do a runoff election when or if it becomes necessary within seven days. And we don't know any country where a runoff election is organized within seven days. In fact, from our studies, uh, the average seems to be six weeks. So we recommended that that should be amended before the 2015 election. It wasn't. So really, a lot of our prayers, my prayers certainly, <laughs> while we were doing the election, was uh, hoping that there will not be a runoff uh, election <laughs> because it would have created a constitutional crisis. The Constitution says do runoff in seven days. It's impossible to do a runoff election in seven days. We tried. We prepared for it. For example, what we did just like we did in 2011, was to print the ballot papers in anticipation of a runoff election. You know? But doing that also has its own problems and could be challenged by those who uh, lost the runoff election. Because we had to put every party on the ballot. Whereas a runoff election is supposed to be between only parties that uh, have the a highest number of votes, the two parties, the leading party and the follow-up party. You know, but there was no other way to do it because there is no way you can produce ballot papers in one week and still be able to deploy uh, for, for an election. So that, that's a major issue, and I think in driving the reform process forward, uh, we, we, we have to pay a lot of attention and give priority to that. The second one is about internal party democracy. You know, it's something we've all been talking about. The Electoral Act has two contradictory provisions. Uh, one provision says that uh, in nominating candidates, candidates in political parties should emerge through a democratic process. And by this provision of Section 87, it implies that there has to be an election, there has to be a winner. Uh, but then Section 31 of the Electoral Act said that uh, when a party submits a candidate uh, as his nominated candidate to INEC, to the Electoral Commission, it cannot be rejected for any reason whatsoever. You know, and, uh, and of course, trust our parties. Virtually every one of the parties uh, nominated candidates that did not meet democratic um, uh, principles. Uh, we have seen candidates nominated who did not even participate in the primaries of parties. We have seen candidates uh, where there is somebody who emerged as number one and number three or number four were submitted by the parties because they knew that we could not reject it uh, for any reason uh, whatsoever. So there are quite a number of areas. Some of them are very, very minor, which could have helped uh, the efficiency of the commission. Uh, uh, I think one example in that regard is, is about um, uh, uh, conducting uh, by-elections. Uh, if somebody dies uh, and they need to be replaced, we have to conduct a by-election. Uh, but we can only conduct, the, one provision says we must conduct a by-election within, uh, I think, uh, two or three weeks. Uh, but then we cannot conduct a by-election until and unless we are notified by the uh, either state assembly or the speaker of the national assembly or the president of the senate. So we could see that we knew we would have information that somebody died, but there would be no communication, you know, and then time uh, provided a law would elapse, and there is nothing we could do about it. So we made recommendations about sanitizing those kinds of... Uh, 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 vagueness or ambiguity in the process. Um, but uh, I think in, in, in general, as I have said, um, uh, we believe that our planning and our methodology 
went right. Uh, it didn't result in a perfect election. Uh, there are still outstanding challenges. Uh, but at least it helped us to deliver to the satisfaction of majority of Nigerians their expectation of free, fair, credible, and peaceful uh, election. And uh, we benefited a lot from partners and uh, 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 even from government commitment itself uh, to the process. Because I think uh, time will come when positive things would be said about Jonathan's government in terms of the support it gave to the commission. All the funding required was provided for. In the past, in Nigeria, deliberate efforts were made to undermine the independence of the commission through manipulation of the funding or financing uh, process. Uh, and uh, also, uh, deliberate efforts were made to undermine the integrity of the commission. There may be many partisan efforts, but none we could directly attribute to, to President Jonathan or to, to the government as such. So I, I think these are very, very important things because driving further electoral, reform, electoral reforms further for the future, and it's a lesson also for many African countries, would require the commitment of government to free democratic elections and to guaranteeing the independence uh, of the Electoral uh, Commission. And perhaps in Nigeria, that independence can be further improved upon, again through legal reforms, by reviewing the, the uh, provisions for the appointment of uh, uh, the chairman, the national commissioners, and the resident uh, electoral commissioners. There are as many ideas as uh, are possible about what can be done, but there are also better models in the African context uh, which we can learn from. Certainly, the way in which the commission is appointed in Kenya and to some extent in South Africa uh, are better in terms of protecting the independence of the commission than the ways in which it's appointed in Nigeria. Uh, uh, that method of appointment has not constrained us or in any way negatively affected the discharge of our responsibilities, but it can be made better uh, uh, for the future. Um, I think I've taken so much time, but uh, let me uh, just say that uh, uh, the most important thing to bear, uh, I believe, in the context of countries like ours, uh, uh, is that good elections are important, but they are not enough for democratic sustenance and socioeconomic transformation of a country. Uh, they are important. Uh, they are necessary, but they are not sufficient, as uh, social scientists say. Uh, and I think in Nigeria, we need to, to, to begin to recognize that uh, good elections are only the starting point. Uh, yes, we've done good elections. We must sustain that. We must not allow regression. We must keep on lifting the bar. But, but that's one aspect. The other aspect, I believe, is that good elections must translate into good democratic governance uh, for them to be truly transformative in addressing the key challenges that a country like Nigeria uh, faces. So, and I'm sure that is the hope and the expectation of many Nigerians with this new change uh, that we are witnessing. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. ask a little bit, you mentioned kind of the, the independence of the commission. Um, there are a lot of rumors and uh, storylines about the postponement uh, of the election and the pressures that you were under. Um, I think I was looking back at some of my emails and it said uh, on the postponement, one, one that subject line was plot against Jega. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the postponement. I mean, there was the, uh, there was a complete revamp of the registration and then the delays on the permanent voter cards mm. that you mentioned. Mm. Um, in the event, the six week postponement allowed some 11 million additional people to be enfranchised mm. as I understand mm. it. Um, the, I think the word from your office was this was a decision that was taken by the military or it was prompted by the security situation in the Northeast. 
so those were two, two narratives. The, narr the other narrative was this is a plot to give the Jonathan administration time to manipulate the polls. I mean, there were, there were all kinds of storylines going on. So now that it's all behind you, what, <laughs> what exactly happened there? And you know, how were you prepared to hold the election on, on the 14th? And would it have been a good, credible election? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, I will say that uh, we were prepared to do the election as we originally scheduled it, and we believed that it would have been a good election. Um, it may not have been as good as what we were able to do after the postponement because we used the six weeks also effectively to keep on improving and fine-tuning uh, the process. I think one very good uh, uh, thing we did with the period of extension was giving additional training to the field uh, uh, staff. And of course, it enabled more people to collect their permanent voters' cards. Because the problem really was not production of the card, that was, a was, was collection. And uh, there seemed to have been a conflation of that. Were all the cards out there to be collected? Um, uh, as of uh, June, uh, sorry, as of um, uh, uh, February. February 28th, there were about 2 million cards that had not been printed. That is 2 million out of close to uh, 29, uh, sorry, 69 uh, million cards. You know. But the, all tens of millions of cards are already in the field for collection, and people are not coming out. Uh, to collect them, and we had no facility or infrastructure to deliver cards to people in their door by door. Uh, residences. And we also deliberately, as a commission, decided to not allow collection by proxy, uh, because otherwise many people would have truly been disenfranchised, because other people would have gone and collected other people's cards, and there is no way that they would have got it back once that had uh, uh, happened. You know, so, but uh, more specifically about the postponement, I will tell you what uh, happened. What happened was that we were invited as a commission to the office of the National Security Advisor, and we had a meeting with all the service chiefs, including the Inspector General of the Police, and we were told at that meeting that there is a compelling reason to recommend a postponement of the election. And they wanted us as a commission uh, to consider this reason and take the decision, because constitutionally it is the decision of the commission. And they said that uh, they have now got a window of opportunity in terms of fighting insurgency in the Northeast region. And they are devoting a lot of their energies into this. And what is the window of opportunity? Two things. They said for the first time, because the Boko Haram insurgents were attacking our neighboring countries, all those three neighboring countries, Cameroon, Chad, and Niger, are now the ones pushing Nigeria for a joint action, while in the past, Nigeria was pursuing them, and they were not forthcoming. And then secondly, they said they had just received delivery of military equipment that they had ordered for a very, very long time. And they believed that with this new equipment and the new partnership that is evolving, they can drive the Boko Haram and they would not be able to cross the borders into other countries. And that would be a good uh, opportunity not to be lost. And they said, while they were doing that, and it was going to take uh, all the period that we had planned for the election, while they were doing that, they would have no time to provide the traditional support that the armed forces provide to the police on election day to deal with security challenges in Nigeria. You know, so, um, well, at that meeting we said, wow, if, if this is it, I think we made two recommendations. One, we said, you need to do more stakeholder engagement. It's not enough to tell us it's an electoral commission. We can't go out of this meeting and go and take 
that decision. You need to contact political parties, you need to contact civil society uh, organizations. And most importantly, you need to formalize it. We need something that this is the uh, strong recommendation of, of uh, this forum. You know, so they, we left that meeting uh, on the understanding that they were going to do more consultations and then they will then get back to us. You know? uh, regrettably, and I, I'm sorry I have to say that because it's factual, you can see the sequence of events. The following day, unknown to us while we were doing that meeting, uh, the National Security Advisor was going to make a presentation at Chatham House the following day in the afternoon. And we were all shocked when news started coming out that the National Security Advisor had stated that actually INEC should extend the election because of challenges with the distribution of the, of the uh, what do you call it? Uh, permanent, uh, permanent voters card. So that, that put us in a very difficult uh, position. We can't come out to say, no, this is what we've been told. And so we, we, we were careful, we took it in stride, but the following week, a National Council of State meeting was called and uh, uh, I was invited to come and brief the National Council of State meeting on our preparations for the, for the elections. Almost exactly a week uh, from the meeting we had with the security agencies. Um, so I was to go there on Thursday. On Wednesday, we received a formal letter signed by the National Security Advisor attaching a letter written to him by the chief of defense staff on behalf of the service chiefs, now formalizing the same thing that they told us at that meeting. So when I went to the National Council of State meeting, I of course made a written presentation and I stated that we were ready to do the election. And I gave all the information about the extent of our preparations. But then I said that yesterday, day before this meeting, this is a formal letter we received. Uh, and uh, this now creates a new uh, challenge. You know, because uh, if the security agencies are saying they cannot guarantee security because of these commitments that they have in the Northeast, uh, then it's something that the commission has to go and look look at, but we hadn't looked at it at that point in time when I was, uh, uh, when I appeared before the National Council of State, and there was a discussion, and unfortunately the discussion in the National Council of State took a partisan uh, line, divide, you know. Some felt that uh, some of the scenarios we developed, that uh, maybe the government was trying to buy more time that uh, if they couldn't deal, if the military couldn't deal with Boko Haram for this long, why, how do they think they can deal with it in, in six weeks, you know? And, uh, uh, but luckily at the National Council of State, all the service chiefs and the NSA were there and they confirmed that the letter had been written and they restated that they could not guarantee uh, security. Um, I think after, because the discussion took partisan line, there was no consensus as to what to do. And in the end, the matter was thrown back to the commission. Somebody just realized <laughs> that, look, constitutionally it's your decision, so go and decide uh, what, what you, you. you want to do. So, so we had to go back to the commission, and then we now decided to do our own stakeholder consultation. So we called a meeting of all chairmen and secretaries of parties and put the matter before them. Simple question. Security cannot be guaranteed. What are the alternatives? Because we need security to conduct election. And uh, nobody could say what the alternative security arrangement will be. We call civil society organizations. We pose the question. Then we now called all the resident electoral commissioners and met with the commission and discussed it. And uh, we decided that we are not going to put the lives of over 750,000 election workers uh, at risk by ignoring the strong recommendation of the military 
uh, uh, and proceeding to conduct the elections as scheduled. Uh, because it was, I mean, there are all sorts of things we envisioned, you know. Uh, what if it is true that a six weeks extension can bring some semblance of normalcy in the Northeast for us to be able to do an election there? Because uh, we were also concerned that if election is not held, uh, there is very likely to be inconclusive, even governorships in, and in, in, in those areas. And then there will be a constitutional crisis. You know, and then most importantly, what if we proceeded to do this election and there is no security support and lives are lost? Who takes a responsibility for that? You know, and we, the commission said we can't do that. So, so we, because of the partisan nature, civil society organizations, many of the parties, everybody said, damn the advice, do the election. But we said we will not do that as a commission. That if they want six weeks, they have six weeks, but six weeks is within the constitutionally defined time frame for the election. You know, beyond that, uh, there is no other scope for, for extension. And so that was how we took the decision, and we are, we are happy that it worked out well. It's not clear that it benefited one party over another. No, clearly way. it did. I don't think, uh, personally, I haven't seen the evidence that uh, the extension benefited one party over another. But although uh, I have had interesting, I've read interesting analysis in the, in the newspapers uh, that perhaps uh, those who lost may have lost with a wider margin if the elections had <laughs> <Yeah>. taken place <laughs> in... Uh, in um, uh, as earlier scheduled, but, but frankly, I haven't seen any concrete evidence one way or the other. Besides which, with a million more people mm. franchised mm. Uh, with a regional concentration mm. in the South, it probably mm. added more credibility no, to, the, to definitely, the definitely it did. By yeah. the losers, yeah, you know, yeah. to, to the losing side. Yes, no, that, definitely that, that's a point. You know, but we didn't want to be dragged into the issue of uh, how many people needed to collect mm. because it's not producing. We have an obligation it's to produce cards. If we did not produce cards, then we have disenfranchised people as a commission. But when we produced millions of cards and people did not collect them, would we be said as a commission to be disenfranchising mm -hmm. uh, people? So, so for example, at the National Council of State, when the issue was raised, we said we need to be advised what is the percentage of collection of cars that is required before an election is held? Because at the time I appeared before the National Council of State, 65% or 67% of all registered voters had collected uh, their cards. So I posed the question, is it 80%, is it 100%? If you say 80%, then it means you can't fix a date for an election until 80% of the people have collected their cards. Because you have no way of knowing that uh, uh, that number of people will collect their cards. You know, so I said a, a country in transition, you know, things cannot be perfect, they will not be normal. You, know, you should just be satisfied that you have reached certain level, a threshold that is comfortable. Uh, to be able to do an election. So, so really that's why, uh, yes, we were happy that more people have collected cars and participated in the election, but as far as we are concerned, we could have done that election with 67% of the cars collected. After all, by the time we, after those six weeks, there were only, I think, about 50,000 cars that had not been produced because of all these challenges that I had mentioned. But, what was the total number of cars collected? We had, we had produced 69 million cars, less about, uh, say, 50,000 or so. You know? But the total number of people who collected their cars before the election was only 56 million. So would we have said that don't do that election until the remaining about 15 million or 13 million or so have collected uh, their cars? So, so, so they are very interesting yeah. uh, questions that challenge both the theory and practice of democracy in a transitional context mm -hmm. uh, such as ours. I want to open up for questions from the audience, but I do have a question about river states. 
Um, and we saw from the transitional monitoring group early on how their figures diverged uh, quite a bit um, from the official count uh, in a way that suggested that they must have been manipulated, that it wasn't stuffing, it was manipulation of the results as they moved up the mm. collation mm. chain. Would, the commission would have caught that eventually, mm. um, but it would have been after results were announced. Mm. How do you, what's the status of that? How, how do you capture that in future? Mm. Um, and what's, what's the, the plan okay. now? Uh, thank you very much. We'll um, rivers had become quite a big issue, um, but we did our best um, to be able to have enough information to take an informed decision before results were, were returned. Uh, we received a petition uh, indicating massive irregularities in, in River State, making allegations uh, about um, use of fake result sheets, about uh, uh, use of photocopied result sheets, about substitution of trained uh, INEC personnel uh, with partisans uh, who would do the beating of, of some parties. And in fact, an allegation that uh, in the majority of the polling units in River State that no election had taken place. And they are very, very serious allegations. So immediately, and the, the letter came before we started compiling and announcing the results. So we immediately constituted a three-man team of national commissioners with a secretariat to go to River State and uh, investigate these uh, allegations. And they, of course, we had limited time frame, and they were there, I think, for no more than 12 uh, hours, certainly less than a day, you know. And they came back, and the report they gave us, they investigated all. First of all, it wasn't true that in the majority of polling, uh, polling units, no election took place. You know, in fact, the evidence was that in the overwhelming majority of the polling units, election had taken place. It wasn't true that there were no, uh, there were fake results sheets. We, they couldn't find any. They couldn't find any photocopy. And what they did when they went, they asked for all the result sheets from all the polling units to be brought to them. And when they were brought, they sampled. Of course, they can't go through everything, but they sampled and they couldn't find any evidence to support the massive allegations. So they came back. When they came back, I also insisted that we needed all the results sheets to be brought uh, to, to the commission. You know? And uh, when we looked at those results sheets, obviously we couldn't find any substantive evidence to support all these wild uh, allegations. You can see some cases of changes of alteration, but you needed to do further investigation to establish whether they are legitimate uh, alterations of corrections or whether they were fraudulent uh, uh, alterations. And our own legal framework had anticipated these challenges and had provided for their resolution through election tribunals after the election. We didn't have the time, and the legal framework uh, is, is not clear as to whether we, can we, we should not announce results until we have done a thorough uh, investigation uh, of uh, petitions. In some, legal, in some countries, the legal framework is very clear. You cannot announce results until all petitions uh, are resolved, and you, have, you can take time to do a thorough. In our own legal framework, we couldn't do that. In fact, doing that would have created more tension uh, uh, in the country. So we were satisfied from our investigation, given the limited time we had, that those allegations were in general superiors and were not substantive enough to require a commission either canceling the election, because that was a request. Mm -hmm. The request is cancel the election. Secondly, um, reports from organizations like TMG are observer reports. And you don't get observer reports until after the election. You know? And they are only meant to help you improve uh, for the future. You know, uh, while in, from some NGOs we are receiving telephone calls to say this is what is happening, we have people in the field that we ask to verify every information that came to our situation room. 
And so we cannot rely on yeah. one observer's uh, report to take such weighty decisions as a cancellation of elections in an entire uh, state. So my honest advice is that if there was such a magnitude of irregularity in rivers, and I'm not saying there are no irregularities, you know, because in all our elections there would be, uh, but they were not to the magnitude that they were made to appear. Now, why was that? Could it be partisan? Could it be, I don't know. You know, could it be mess wrong messaging? Were people being misinformed? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but it's good to investigate it. But again, as a commission, we feel confident that we have put sufficient measures and checks and balances that if such massive irregularities had occurred, then people should be able to present the evidence uh, to the tribunals, and then the tribunals should be able to uh, make appropriate judgments with regards to the election in rivers. So we are all now looking. We, we, we've committed ourselves to giving all the official information that we have. You know, and uh, of course, our politicians, they will also be protesting that our state office is very slow in giving them the documents they require. But any time we receive that information, we intervene. We say, hasten the process. We are not hiding anything. We will not protect any INEC staff who has done anything wrong. Give all the information and let the tribunals decide eventually as to what happened in Rivers or any other state for that matter. Great. And I want to give um, audience members a chance to ask some questions here. I'm sure there's many. Let me get my glasses on. Yes. Should we take a few at a time? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, let's a take few a few at a time, at a time three at uh, a time. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Many of us watched with amazement the, what occurred when, you, when the votes were being counted, when um, Mr. Orubebe intervened. For some, it looked like a tempest in a teapot, but all over the internet there was um, indication that it might, there must have been a, a lot more amiss than, than we actually saw, that that could have actually resulted in something much more serious and sinister. Can you um, explain what happened? Okay, and then the gentleman here in front. And then we'll go, I didn't recognize you, Ambassador, but added for you, but go ahead. And we'll turn it Hello, my name is Simon Adeji. Um, I totally understand the complexity of Nigeria because I'm a Nigerian, but I live here in DC right now. Um, you've shown integrity and leadership demeanor as well as in depth of experience. My major question would be, moving forward, will there be a situation where proteges will be created or would this experience that you've gained be channeled into a, a more institutionalized platform where it will be used as a template, so to speak, to forge your head in situations like this. Um, pretty much that's what my question is. Very good one. Ambassador. Uh, uh -oh. Just a statement. Um, I had the privilege of hosting Professor Jiga in my office yesterday. Pardon? I had the privilege of hosting Professor Jega in my office yesterday, as he normally does when he visits here. I just want to make a statement on behalf of my staff and the generality of Nigerians in the United States. I've always said before the elections, I had cause to come here to Atlantic Council to spend think tanks to reassure our friends about the fact that Nigeria, after the election 2015, will remain standing. I'm sure you know what I mean by that. But the, and I, I did, I based my, my optimism on three factors. Once, number one, Nigerians are inherently democratic. We want to be democratic. We don't want any military regime. We are determined to live together as one entity, united entity. And three, the personality and character of the Independent Electoral Commission, especially its chairperson. And knowing Atari Jagger for quite a while, he was a chairman in ASU. I knew that just as it is in 2011, you make 2015 uh, a much improved uh, election. And we are proud of him, just here to say to all of you here that we, members of the United Committee of the United States, 
since the elections, I've not turned down any invitation to talk about Nigeria for the simple reason that I can raise my head high and say, in Nigeria, we have done it. And we did it because of him, because of his personality and character. I'm here to say to him that, Professor Jega, we admire you, we cherish you, and we are intensely very proud of you. You have made democracy strengthen in Africa and made us proud as Nigerians. The only small item which we have to argue, I was asking yesterday whether I will continue, and it has to do with the question which the gentleman asked, and I asked him whether I will continue. He has said clearly that he's not, in spite of all my attempts to, to pursue him. But just let him know, we Nigerians, we don't take no easily for an answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador. Let's take one more before we uh, turn back. Yes, the gentleman. My name is Laia Begun. Uh, my own question is practical one that happened. My own son was born and raised in Lagos, but when he was serving for National Youth Service, he was posted to Cross River State in Calabar to serve. It was during that time that he registered for voting in Calabar. But he has left Calabar, finished his service, moved back to Lagos during the election. So he was not allowed to vote. It was stated that you can only vote where you register. So what are you doing to improve this situation? Because many that I know, at least four or five students like that, who went and served in different states, they were not allowed to vote. So what are you doing to improve this? Because this affected the disfranchisement of many uh, voters in Nigeria, particularly in Lagos State. That's my question. Okay. And a good one, because I just want to give a shout out to the Youth Corps, who uh, is uh, so dedicated, um, so inspiring, and so energizing yeah. in these elections. Absolutely. And they deserve a chance oh, to vote as well. Definitely. So why don't we turn to you for those three All in right. the comment um, of them. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the Urubebe incident was unfortunate, uh, <laughs> uh, regrettable. But frankly, I don't know whether there are any other, uh, there are all sorts of scenarios uh, and the th or theories about why what had happened happened. But frankly, I have no uh, information or evidence to, to comment uh, on that. So it's a bit like Karl Rove breaking down on the eve of the Obama election. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can I say that? Right. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but I, I hope we learn the lessons also from that and move on. You know? Statesmen should be statesmen, you know? and, it's, and we need more role models rather than people who can make those kinds of uh, demonstrations in public. Um, uh, moving forward, we've done quite a lot in INEC in the last five years to uh, commence and uh, do a lot of processes of institutionalization. Uh, because quite early we realized that uh, in Nigeria, as in many countries like ours, there are weak institutions. And quite early we discovered how weak INEC was as an institution, and we realized that a process of institutionalization that can make the Electoral Commission stronger, more professional, more competent, and not susceptible to the whims and caprices of the individual members of the commission or the chairman was necessary. So a lot of the things we did with regards to the organization and restructuring of INEC uh, is really to make it as a more competent and effective institution that can not only survive us, but can resist uh, uh, any idiosyncrasies that can lead in a negative uh, direction. Um, and uh, you see, I feel happy when I sit in a group like this or when I go uh, into gatherings and people are showering uh, praises on me and giving me all the credit. <laughs> You know, but people are forgetting that I was just a chairman of a commission of 12 members. 
and we worked really as a collective, you know. And so we all take the credit. And there are people in that commission and amongst the resident electoral commissioners who, if given the opportunity, may even do better than I have done. Nigeria is a country with such you know, incredibly talented people uh, who have either been denied opportunity or who have been frustrated and made indifferent by the crisis of governance in our country. I never knew I was going to be a chairman of the Electoral Commission. I had the opportunity. I did my best. There are many other people out there uh, who can add value, who can keep on uh, improving on what we've been able to do uh, for the future. So really, when I said in the commission we think this is a turning point, we believe so. And uh, what is required now <coughs> is sustainability and the avoidance of regression. And there are many people in the commission, as well as outside of the commission, uh, who, given the opportunity, uh, will be able to keep on raising the bar uh, of the electoral process. So I have little concerns about sustainability and about uh, institutionalization. I believe the foundation is there, you know, and there are so many people. Uh, I, I think uh, what is important, obviously, is to recognize the need for continuity. And continuity is not about the chairman. It's about the commission, you know, and that is what is most important, you know. So, so frankly, uh, I think there is a lot to be pleased about. Uh, it's not to underestimate the challenges of institutionalization and the keeping on improving and reforming the process, you know, but I think there are many people in INEC who can do that and many who have been happy with the reform process uh, who, if given the opportunity, can also add value. Uh, um, Ambassador, I, I can't say anything more than thank you for your very kind words, as usual. Uh, but remember, I'm a Nigerian also. If you say no, I can say no. So <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really thank you for, for your very kind uh, words. Um, um, but uh, I think the key challenge for all of us as Nigerians is not to spend so much time in the euphoria of being happy with what has happened. Yes, there is a lot to be happy about, but we, we all have to reinforce our commitment to ensuring, as I have said, that good elections are not enough. You have to convert the outcome of that good election to good democratic governance. It's a big challenge, and we all have individual's role to play. So we shouldn't just sit back and be gloating about a wonderful and excellent election you know, and allow things to, uh, to get back to, you know, uh, the muddling process. Because in Nigeria, we specialize in muddling through uh, our problems. So, so, so really, for me, I think that is a key challenge that uh, we use every opportunity to, to emphasize. NYSC, I will join you to give another round of applause for our young men and women of the National Youth Service Corps. <laughs> and, um, as many of you are aware, these are young men and women uh, who have just finished their degree uh, or national diploma, who have just graduated from a tertiary institution, and who are on one year compulsory national service. And they are posted to states other than their own. Uh, because the NYSE emerged as part of that uh, effort to help the process of national integration. So that if people serve in other countries, they will make friends and they will know the culture and it will impact uh, on their psyche and, and also help in national integration. So in, in INEC, when we were confronted with the challenge of the numbers of people we need uh, to work in an election uh, uh, as ad hoc workers or temporary workers, you know, we, we started thinking about what to do. In the Nigerian context, if we do what other countries do, which is you advertise and you select and you appoint, we had tremendous apprehensions 
that uh, politicians will uh, corner the process of who works as an ad hoc staff in the electoral process. So we said, how can we uh, do this? And the idea came that, look, you know, the NYSC can, can be a tremendous asset. First of all, they are on national service. Many of them are passionate about this national service. Even the few who are not so passionate uh, uh, want to get their certificates. Uh, because in Nigeria, you can't get a job if you, if you are a graduate and you don't have the, the certificate, the National Youth Service Corps certificate. So uh, uh, many of them, even if only for fear of getting their certificates, will do well uh, when they are given such uh, responsibilities. You know, and uh, we uh, were able to develop a memorandum of understanding with the directorate headquarters of the NYSC. And uh, they, we've worked very, very well together in terms of uh, what kinds of motivation we need to give them, what kinds of protection and security we need to give them, uh, particularly given the unfortunate post-election violence in 2011 when nine uh, youth coppers died. Uh, and so, so we worked very closely with the directorate headquarters of the NYSC, and from all the reports we received, in fact, one of the first things that were commended by observers was the diligence, the uh, co commitment, you know, and, and really the, the vibrancy of the youth corps while they were discharging those uh, uh, responsibilities. Uh, of course, I must say that we couldn't get all the numbers we needed from the National Youth Service Corps uh, because in any given, there are three batches in AYA, but in any service year, there are no more than 400,000 uh, youth coppers. So we complemented that number with uh, students from federal tertiary institutions in the penultimate year. Uh, and and it, it's worked very well. Uh, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's really formidable to use 400,000 and at the end of an exercise to have no more than 10, maximum 20 of them that uh, can be disciplined for any uh, infraction or irregularity. It's, it's, it's simply amazing. So with every opportunity we have, we, we say thank you to them because the success is also more uh, uh, attributable to their uh, field commitment and uh, fearlessness because many of them also worked under very, very intimidating uh, contexts. Um, uh, now, the issue of transfer, uh, sorry, uh, registering in one place and not being able to vote. Um, the legal framework provides for transfer and people can do a transfer uh, up to 30 days before an election, even though it's one of the things that we recommended for an amendment. Uh, because um, we are required to publish the register for the election 30 days before an election. But we were also required to do transfers up to 30 days uh, before an election. So it's really almost technically impossible to transfer somebody on the 30th day and still be able to put him or her on the register for the, for the election. So uh, that was one area we wanted to sanitize. But the point I'm making is that any person who has registered, regardless of who they are, uh, once they move, they have an opportunity to have their registration status transferred well in advance of the election. And many Nigerians transferred uh, before the 2015 general election. So I don't know what would have happened. Maybe they were not aware about the transfer process, or maybe it was too late uh, uh, when they moved. You know, but that opportunity uh, uh, is there. But for me, that's not really the, the most worrying aspect about disenfranchising the use corpus. You know, the most worrying aspect is the fact that we had not been able to allow them to vote, which you alluded to, uh, during the election. Um, we didn't do it in 2011. We wanted to do it in 2015. We didn't plan well for it. Uh, so if you're asking what went wrong, this is one thing that went wrong. 
we couldn't plan well to allow not only youth corpus but also security personnel to be able to vote. Um, so it, it, it's, it's something again that we believe the next commission will take on board before the next election, uh, consistent with good practice globally, uh, all essential service personnel on election duty should be able to vote maybe a day or so before, uh, or a week or so before the election. And also youth coppers should be able to vote. I will always remember an anecdote. Uh, after the 2011 general election, a youth copper, a, a she, a lady that served in Lagos, wrote me a letter uh, saying how very happy she was to be able to serve her country uh, uh, as uh, an ad hoc staff, but regretting that uh, it was her first opportunity to vote. But she couldn't vote because by agreeing to, to, do, to be an ad hoc staff, she had given up that opportunity. I told this story severally to my colleagues in uh, INEC, and uh, we said we must do something before 2015. Unfortunately, we, we, we couldn't do it. Um, it's a long story, but, uh, but I think it's something that we, we needed to do. I did a polite letter for her and told her that the benefits of the national service she did, I believed, outweighed the cost of missing her. <laughs> I, I don't think she believed me, but... Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yes. Let's take a few more. Yes, the gentleman here in the front with the beard. Thank you, Ryan Dalton from NDI. Thank you for uh, coming here today, uh, Professor Jenga. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing um, all your insights. Um, I did want to press a little bit more on the question of South-South and the inflated voter turnout. Um, though given the, uh, the allegations that prove mostly fruitless in the Commission's investigation, um, but also given that voter turnout inflation uh, found by civil society in four different states, um, what are the plans for um, Kogi and Bielsa? Uh, in the upcoming by-elections. Um, Bielsa was, after all, one of those four states that TMG had exposed for having voter inflation, voter turnout inflation. So um, does the commission have a strategy in place, uh, something that's taking shape uh, based on some of the findings from their investigation uh, in those states during the March elections? And is there another role that you see for civil society going forward? We have a lady in the far back. Thank you. Uh, Prof, my question to you is... If you could uh, introduce yourself. What? If you could introduce yourself. Oh, okay. I'm Shutude Viola. Uh, I'm a recent graduate from National Defense University. Uh, my question is about what you're doing about the diaspora voting and uh, the violence, post-election violence. What do you have in place for those? Thank you. Uh, okay. Well, do the uh, there's. Oops, she got her hand down now. Um, yes, the gentleman there, and then me, and then here, and then I think we have to call it. Uh, I'm Casey Obioha. I'm from California, through Nigeria. I'm, I'm a Nigerian, <laughs> but live in California. I'm in the private sector. I manufacture products, and uh, Nigeria is a major market for my brand. Uh, Professor Jagger, everybody praises you, and you're so humble to say that, hey, take me out of this. There's a system, there's a structure I've put in place. I just want to borrow from you uh, economic development. America puts so much emphasis on elections. Conduct good elections, you become a democracy. And I hear you saying that it takes more than elections especially in Nigeria, to bring up opportunities, create jobs, so that the average Nigerian can live a better life. There are other institutions that need a Professor Jagger. So we need to document your good practices and see if we can transfer that to the judiciary, rule of law, 
and other institutions that strengthen democracy in Africa. But the major issue, which you diplomatically put away, it's the executive in Africa is so powerful that they subvert democratic institutions. But it wasn't done with INEC. Your ambassador pleaded with you to stay back. But again, as a professional, your answer is that, hey, I have people that can do what I've done. But can you tell us how we can create other Professor Jaggers in the other institutions that will enhance democracy in Nigeria. Thank you very much. I envision a Bayero University Center for Electoral Law and Management. <laughs> <laughs> and I have yeah. this perfect chair. <laughs> uh, let's go with the gentleman there and then me, and that's the final. So. Okay, um, I'm afraid we're we're just at, almost at time. Um, pardon? Well, there's other folks with their hands up. I didn't see your hand up. I'm afraid. <laughs> okay, okay, knees giving it up. Okay, let's go over the gentleman here, and we'll end with the. Um, um, good afternoon, Professor. Uh, my name is uh, Kende Ojo. I'm a student here at University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, so first, uh, let me commend you for your uncanny demeanor, which you use in responding to the PDP Star Wars, uh, God's Day Urubebe. Um, for those who don't know God's Day Urubebe, it was a PDP Star Wars, and it tried to stir up um, Mali during you know, the process of collating the votes. And it was, the professor was able to you know, respond to that in, uh, in, in a very uncanny demeanor. And, and that, that kind of like, you know, said to the issues. So, um, so my question now, my question is mainly on uh, the subject of efficiency. Uh, the commission did uh, apply and deploy things like social media, t using Twitter, using uh, biometric voters registration card and, um, and the reader's card, like you said. However, it was, um, it was contradictory when you decided to you know, manually collate those votes. I mean, over 72 hours was lost during that process. And um, so moving forward now, what do you think uh, you would have done better? Would you have um, deployed technology during that process? Do you think that would have um, helped? Great. Thank, Thank you. you. And Madame, it's hard to say no to a Nigerian reporter, <laughs> can I say? <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, Professor Jaga is just somebody you, you, know, you can't but talk about him. OK? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. My name is Adeyemi Omojola, Fatoba, of course, a Nigerian. And um, the bureau chief of uh, national TV, which we call Nigerian Television Authority here in the United States. So you know why I'm here. Um, the INEC chairman, we can but say something about you. Is it the professionalism? Is it the high level of calmness you know, that you displayed that ultimately led to the success story we talk, we t we we're, we're talking about today? Because that particular episode was something else. I was watching it and I'm like, Jesus Christ, what are we seeing? But calmly, you know, you just said, um, you said, elder statesman, you, okay, you said he was a minister of the Federal Republic and then there are ways elders should behave in the public. And then it was calm. Everybody was like, how did you do it? So we would always talk about it and we thank God for using you you know, uh, uh, at that crucial time. So thank you, so I will continue to say that. We can't thank you enough. And my question is this, because we read a lot of stories, people say, um, they, can never be, they can never be satisfied, you know that. Politicians and their fans, they still say that, Jagad, Jagad us. I, I believe you understand that language, like saying, oh, there are some whatever games anywhere. But, can you just expantiate? Because I like the statement you made that one day, President Goodluck Jonathan will be commended for one thing, that he gave the commission the support that commission actually required. Can you please expantiate? So how independent was the commission under you? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. 
Let's turn back to you. <laughs> okay, For thank final you. Final word. Thank you so much. Um, um, uh, frankly, the question from the gentleman from NDI, uh, I, I, I don't, uh, there isn't much I can say uh, about uh, what you call the inflated voter turnout from the South South, uh, other than what I've already said. Um, I believe that if those irregularities are so massive, the evidence will come out sooner uh, or later. And then we will know how come we were not able to find it when the commission tried uh, to, to investigate what happened uh, before the, the announcement. So, so um, what is clear to me is that there are sufficient checks and balances that we put in place that would make it impossible for such massive rigging, if it had occurred, uh, to go uh, un undetected and therefore uh, to not be reversed, you know. So, so um, uh, we did our best. We didn't find sufficient uh, grounds to support the allegations made. And we certainly couldn't take decision on the basis of information we are getting from NGOs because we had field officers. Uh, in fact, uh, one best way that NGOs had helped us was as things were going on. For example, if as things were going on uh, during the election in River States, NGOs were sending us information to say we are in this polling unit and uh, uh, nothing is going on. There is no election in this polling unit. We have monitors in the field that we can ask to go and verify that information. But the TMG information people are talking about is something that has been uh, uh, compiled from uh, what they said they did, the parallel tabulation, and which uh, we only saw after the, the election had taken place. So what is the source of that data? Because you, you also have to be careful. Who were the people deployed in the field? Who generated that information? How was it fed in? You know, I'm not questioning the integrity of the process because I know they did a commendable job and they've done their best. You know, but there are a lot of unanswered questions that we need to interrogate. So I think uh, the elections and the turnout in the South South will, uh, I'm glad my friends in the academia are here. We should put PhDs to start studying what actually happened in the elections in the, in the, in the South South. You know. So, but beyond that, frankly, there isn't much I can say. For, for example, as I speak with you, one of the things we wanted to do, we've done it, but we have not completed it. As I speak with you, we have scanned 95% of the result sheets from all the polling units. 95% is still not 100%. And we will put that on the website. And I will not be surprised you know, if some of this information now begins to go to court as, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, material evidence for the tribunal adjudication, you know? So is it, is it that these are fake result sheets that are produced and put? That will come out in the tribunal and we'll find who is responsible uh, for doing that, you know? So, or if they are genuine, Result sheets. So where is that information coming that said there was no election that had taken place in those places? So I think the key issue for an election management body is how it tries to put check and balances and to ensure transparency. So because transparency will reveal uh, whatever has happened rightly uh, or, or wrongly. You know, so... Uh, um, now, um, we've already done by-elections, by the way, in Bayelsa and the Kogi. The Bayelsa by-elections took place last uh, Saturday while we were out uh, um, in Mexico. Uh, but uh, in general, it went well, even though there is uh, one place, I think Brass, where the result was inconclusive from the reports that we had. Uh, because the total number of council votes was more than the difference between the, uh, uh, what do you call it, 
the leading Very candidate good. and the runner up, you know, but the report I got was that uh, thugs compelled the returning officer to make a return. And unfortunately, in our legal jurisdiction, you know, once a return is made, I know it is wrong, the commission knows it is wrong, we can't cancel it. It is only the tribunal that now can act on that. And you see, this is not the first time it has happened. In Ondo State, in Ilaje, after we did the election, uh, some politicians are beginning to realize that weakness in the law. To, to, you know, they will come, they will surround the polling unit, they would have lost the election, but because they are dominant in terms of the power display there, they will compel the returning officer to declare the results that they wanted. And the Electoral Commission cannot cancel that the result once the returning officer has signed until it goes to the tribunal. The commission took a decision in respect of Ilaji, and we said that, okay, um, since we have reports that this is what happened, then the chairman will not sign the certificate of return, you know, because we have evidence that that was done under uh, duress. Uh, duress, you know. So again, we are testing the law. This is one way we are beginning to test the law. Okay, if you can force somebody to declare you, can you force us to give you a certificate of return and let them go to court? to say that we've denied them a certificate of return so that we can tell the court why we denied them a certificate of return. And that's what we may do in Bielsa if the information I received so far is correct because it seems almost in tandem uh, with what had happened in, uh, in Ilaje in Ondo State. Uh, but the point is we've done, there are many, uh, 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 what do you call it? inconclusive elections uh, that we did there. Uh, I think in Bielsa we did about five or six. Uh, only one has this challenge, which I have described. In Kogi, we did it several weeks ago and successfully. Uh, and, uh, uh, but there are a lot of lessons to do. We are commencing in the next one week when we return the series of post election reviews and assessments. Something we did in 2011. We are going to do it for 2015 elections. We wouldn't want the new commission to come and start assessing what they were not a part of. So we want to generate information and analysis which they can inherit and which may be useful uh, to them. So through those retreats, what we did in 2011 and we are going to do now is we are going to hold retreat and meet with all the electoral officers from the local government headquarters. You know, EOs, they are called electoral officers. They head the local governments. There are 774 local governments. So we are planning a meeting. The commission will meet with all the electoral officers under what we call Chatham House rules. And we say, look, forget what went well. Tell us what, what went wrong and how can we uh, address it. We did that in 2011, it was very useful. So we are going to do it. After that, we meet with administrative secretaries and resident electoral commissioners. Then after that, the commission will now meet and look at all of this information and generate a report. So hopefully through that, we will be able to also get more insight about all the allegations uh, about what happened in the South South, uh, so that at least we can plan for the future or enable the new commission to plan for the future. Now, um, I'm sorry, I think I'm taking more time, but the uh, um, role of civil society, okay. yes, um, I think we developed a good relationship and I think it's good and we need to keep on uh, forging that relationship. Diaspora voting um, is a legal constraint. Uh, the legal framework says you have to register in a polling unit in Nigeria and vote. So, but we recommended, it's one of the things we recommended for changing. We said that that provision should be removed so that we can plan for diaspora voting because that's the trend globally, it's good practice. It enables uh, uh, citizens resident in other countries to be able to participate in their country's affairs. And we think it's something we should be able to do. So our hope is that amendment to the electoral 
uh, uh, legal provisions would uh, enable the commission to perhaps before the 2019 general elections put something in place for diaspora voting. Maybe we can respond to our reporter. I think the gentleman who asked the question on technology has gone, and in my bad time management, I've, I've gone way over. Yeah. Um, we piloted, we piloted a result, an electronic results transmission system. And uh, we started piloting it soon after the 2011 general elections. So when we did, I think the first place we tried it was with regards to the governor's governorship election we did in Cross River State. Then we kept on improving upon it. And then along the way, the failure of electronic transmission in Kenya raised a lot of concerns for politicians, even in Nigeria, about whether a failure of technology can undermine the integrity of the election or whether technology can be used to manipulate the election. And in the heat and the run off to our elections, at the last minute, uh, we had a robust debate in the commission as to whether to move it from experimental and launch it for the 2015 general elections or continue with it still as a pilot by selecting a few states to try it or just put it aside. And in the end, we decided that, look, that we were already chewing too much with the card reader and the uh, uh, PVC and all the things that were accompanying it. We thought it's something we can defer uh, for the future. So uh, certainly electronic transmission of results will make for efficiency, but it requires trust and confidence uh, and also safeguards that can ensure that technology is not mis misapplied. One of the interesting anecdotes we have was when we went to Germany and we asked questions about why is it that uh, they are not doing uh, machine voting, you know? <laughs> and uh, and uh, I mean, it, it's clear, it's a matter of trust. You know, if people suspect that machines can be manipulated and they would rather see literal evidence that if, if it becomes necessary, you can go and check and cross-check. You know, so, and in our own environment, that trust has not built up to the level where we can take the plunge. Um, how independent is INEC? I, I, believe, I believe that INEC was probably uh, the most independent of the Nigerian electoral commissions. Uh, I believe it was largely because of some of the reform measures that were uh, implemented after the Justice Mohammed Lawal Uwais Electoral Reform Committee in 2008, 2009. Uh, for example, uh, arising from that uh, committee's work, the financial autonomy of the commission was guaranteed. We were no longer as a commission having to go cap in hand uh, once our budget is appropriated by the National Assembly, all the funds had to be released and released uh, regularly. Uh, although, of course, the budgeting process itself had its own uh, complications. But, uh, but in general, we enjoyed greater financial autonomy than uh, uh, previous commissions. And we enjoyed greater support and encouragement from the government on a nonpartisan basis, recognizing our independence, I believe, than all previous commissions. And that's where, personally, I give credit to the Jonathan uh, administration. You know, we went to them and said, we want to do PVC. And they agreed, and they put it uh, in our budget. We said, after PVC, we want to do card readers. And they agreed, and they put it uh, uh, in our budget. Uh, uh, of course, subsequently, uh, some partisans realized that the card reader and PVC were going to prevent uh, uh, irregularities, and they mounted a last-minute ditch effort to get us to truncate all those. We said no. We said we can't spend this much money on something that we believe can work and then simply because some people are raising objection, we just put it aside. So, and we remain focused. And I think in the end, we are all pleased that it worked well and it added value uh, to the process. 
You know, so I think the key challenge is to ensure that the next commission uh, gets even more support and encouragement from the government than we have got, because that is what can further strengthen that independence. Uh, and also appoint uh, uh, credible people, appointments that can make for continuity, and also that can add to the credibility uh, of, the pro of the commission. Thank you. We are at time, um, so I'm reluctant to close this down because I could ask questions the rest of the afternoon. Um, Professor Jaga, thank you so much. I think one of the key things throughout your tenure has been documenting what went wrong as well as what went right, learning from it, and that has been from election to election, but it's also been from, from week to week and month to month. And I think, to me, that feedback of accountability and learning um, has been uh, really critical to the success of INEC. And as the young man here said, I hope that that cycle of learning and feedback can, continues to, to, to kind of build the capacities of the institution. I know, I don't know what your plans are next. Um, I'm hoping uh, that you'll stay engaged um, in building that capacity and building um, that kind of institutional uh, uh, kind of knowledge and base in Nigeria. There are also a lot of elections coming up in West Africa and beyond, and I hope um, that you can uh, also be a resource for many of the other countries facing similar challenges. And if you can do it in Nigeria, um, it can be done. Um, it can be done elsewhere. So please join me in thanking Professor Jaga um, and congratulating.